and was only suitable for people aged 18 or over will almost certainly have an adult theme and might well contain secrets or violence which are quite graphic. It may also contain explicit language, including sexual swear words. Thanks for listening. Uh, but here's what his revelation comes to him. He's kind of got all this stuff, like, uh, touching, wiping, mourning of the animals. Not wiping, whipping. whipping. Yeah. <laughs> also, yeah, not torture. Touch, also not touching. I am, <laughs> I am dyslexic. I, I hope I'm not having like, a stroke. Do it live! Fuck it! Do it live! And an atheist almost always becomes supporters of eugenics and abortion. A swine is hungry for nuts. And Jesus hates them too. Yeah. Satan is real. Being a Satanist is an open declaration of revolt against counterproductive received wisdom and mindless rogue tradition. Decapitate her head off. We're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. Obama! Hi everybody, this is Dan Ellis from the Godless Revolution Podcast. Matt and Ryan, my incredibly awesome co-hosts, are not in studio with me because this isn't traditional Godless Revolution fare. What you are about to hear is a talk on the intersection of humanism and polyamory as presented by Dr. Richard Carrier. Atheists of Utah was fortunate to be able to work with Dr. Carrier to sponsor this event at the downtown Salt Lake City Public Library on May 25th while he is moving across country. I apologize for the audio quality not being quite as good as the talk deserves, but the content is very interesting and informative. I have several friends in the polyamory community, and I thought I knew a lot about their world, but I learned more during this one talk than I have in the last two or three years combined. Richard Carrier, Ph.D., is a philosopher and historian with degrees from Berkeley and Columbia, specializing in the contemporary philosophy of naturalism and in Greco-Roman philosophy, science, and religion, including the origins of Christianity. He blogs and lectures worldwide teaches courses online at Partners for Secular Activism, and is the author of many books, including his defense of a naturalist worldview in Sense and Goodness Without God, his academic case for the non-existence of Jesus in On the Historicity of Jesus, his work on historical methodology in Proving History, his study of ancient science in science education in the early Roman Empire, his responses to 21st century Christian apologetics in Why I Am Not a Christian, and Not the Impossible Faith, and an anthology of his papers on the subject of history in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. He has also authored chapters in many other books, and articles in magazines and academic journals, and on his namesake blog, covering subjects from politics and philosophy to feminism and polyamory. For more about Dr. Carrier and his work, see www.richardcarrier.info. Thank you very much for coming out. Richard's here, just barely hopped out of the new hall, so. Little. <laughs> without any further ado, Dr. Richard Carrier. It's great to be in Salt Lake City. This is my first time, actually, and I'm hoping to come back someday. Enjoy it more rather than just this flyby on my way to Columbus. Uh, I literally have everything I own in tow. It's all in a truck and a car being towed behind it uh, my entire life, moving from California uh, to Columbus, Ohio. And I'm glad to have an audience to come here and talk to about something interesting, the intersection of humanism and polyamory. Uh, for those who don't know, um, I've become polyamorous and have been uh, openly polyamorous for a year and a half at least. Um, I had an uh, open relationship for a few years before that uh, that was different than polyamory. I'll talk about the differences later uh, as I get through the talk. But what I want to talk about today is where humanism and polyamory meet and how they can help each other, actually. Uh, and I want to start with defining humanism. Um, humanists, by definition, I would argue, uh, want a better world for humanity. Uh, and this entails, they argue, compassion, evidence-based morality, and a determined escape from religious influences over your mind, culture, and laws. Uh, that's humanism, I think, in a nutshell. Now there are um, examples, for example, of religious influence that humanists fight are homophobia, transphobia, single motherhood, and non-marital sexual relationships, meaning stigma against these things. You may, many of you might not know that there was a time in U.S. history not too long ago when being a single mother was enormously uh, targeted with prejudice uh, in many different ways. Uh, social disadvantages, uh, frowned upon, uh, tisk tisk, and so on. Uh, before that, it could even be more severely punished. 
Uh, and even just the idea of non-marital sexual relationships, which you take for granted now, uh, that was not always the case. Uh, there was hostility to this. So we've had an evolving uh, morality over time uh, towards sexuality. We've become more understanding and permissive and saying, you know, a lot of these rules, the reason we're punishing and, and criticizing and denouncing people for their sexual behaviors um, and their personal life choices and so forth doesn't make any sense. And this, a lot of this seems to be coming from religion. Um, big surprise. Uh, so, so we have that problem, uh, and humanists have already been dealing with those things, and that's pretty already normal. Uh, and I'm going to give you some examples of why this ties into some other things. So, for example, opposition to uh, single motherhood, non-sexual, uh, non-marital sexual relationships. Uh, also, these are the kinds of things. This, this hostility to sexuality is also what the abortion debate, uh, debate is about. It's, an, of course, an attempt to control female sexuality uh, and to force women into subservience to men. Uh, now, it doesn't do that directly, of course, but it says, well, if you can't have an abortion, then you have to have a kid, and therefore, the argument goes, you need to get a man uh, to take care of you. Uh, and this is kind of a, the way Christians want to mold society. This is their model of how society works. Uh, the man works at home, the woman take, or the man works, the woman stays at home, takes care of the kids. They keep trying to recreate uh, this worldview, and opposing abortion is part of the, the key piece to this, uh, to make sure it kind of force women into their model. Um, also, however, the same is true even of opposition to gay rights. Uh, Amanda Marcotte uh, wrote a really good article on this, uh, how, pointing out how, uh, in some uh, of these oppositions, the opponents of gay rights have actually given away the game on this, points out how actually the reason they don't want gay marriage is because they want to support gay women. And you might wonder how, what is the connection from one to the other? Well, the fact of the matter is, their worldview, their model, as I just said, has men on top, women subservient, having the babies, right? So they want this uh, traditional man-woman marriage, hierarchical marriage that favors men, uh, has women doing their will, essentially. Uh, even if not you know, literally in every sense, but nonetheless in enough senses. However, if the government admits, the government of all things, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen to them, the government admits that marriage is not about sex and reproduction, that in fact it is only about love, um, this directly attacks their worldview and actually attacks their attempt to try and recreate this world where women are subordinate to men in traditional marriages. Uh, so this is how they see it. Uh, homosexual marriage threatens this because it's actually acknowledging that marriage isn't really about subordination. It isn't really even a gender thing. Um, they don't like that. Now, I, I've encountered many cases of even atheists, including some humanists, uh, who still have and continue to have negative beliefs and attitudes about gay people, uh, uh, trans people, single mothers, non-marital sexual relationships even. Um, it's different, it's not as bad, it's not as severe, uh, but there's these latent, sometimes running these latent negative attitudes. Because there are, in fact, many remnants about of sh many remnants of shame uh, about sex. For example, thinking it is somehow dirty or shameful or scandalous or impolite to talk about it. Um, these things continue even after you abandon religion. And in fact, even if you were never religious because the culture that influenced and programmed you was built by Christians. And it retains its Christian features even after it goes secular. So humanists still need to work on abandoning their own shame-based thinking about sex, if, if such they find in themselves. And this actually has demonstrated uh, many aspects of this in terms of how the retention of shame-based thinking about sex is, uh, exists in the secular community, and also what happens when you get rid of it, and how you might get rid of it, uh, and so on. It's actually covered in Daryl Ray's book, Sex and God, which I highly recommend. Uh, he talks about everything I've just talked about in great detail, about how uh, religion is really trying to get uh, into your pants, essentially. But also parents need to think about this. Uh, you could be teaching, by word or just an inadvertent example, the same fossilized sexual mores without even realizing it. So that's also an important thing. So think of it also not just in terms of how you interact with the world, but also uh, how you're raising the next generation. OK, so that's humanism, uh, and that's uh, how humanism has gotten involved in sexuality issues already. Uh, now let's talk about the second part of this intersection, which is polyamory and other forms of ethical non-monogamy. Um, the things I recommend, by the way, I can't go into every detail because this is so multifaceted. There's so many things I could say. I could give a whole talk just on polyamory, and that wouldn't even touch everything. Uh, but the best thing to look at, I think, to start, if you want something quick to, to figure out, is both the website and the book, More Than Two. Uh, that's actually probably the best place to start. Um, I find it has the best articles and chapters on every issue related to this that I find is most in agreement with my thinking as well. Um, so that's if you're looking for a book, if you're looking for a website to start with. But however, Google will help you with almost any question you can think of now. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. 
Um, I also myself have articles on polyamory on my own blog, not many, uh, but I write, I'll be writing more in the future as well. Um, down the left margin of my blog is an extensive subject in index. Polyamory is on that, so if you want to see what else I've written on polyamory, um, you'll find it there. Uh, and my blog you can find through richardcarrier.info. Now, what has changed over the last generation uh, that is, make, makes this a significant issue to talk about now is that there's in fact a growing community working on developing and promulgating the best ethics regarding polyamory and other forms of ethical non-monogamy. And we have a large knowledge base now uh, from the earned, earned experience of thousands of people practicing these things over decades, both online and in print. This is something where almost any question you can think of about polyamory or ethical non-monogamy, Google it, you could probably find several writers writing interesting things about it. Now, several of the things to understand about this is the distinction between sex and love, of course. Um, these are two different things. Um, and how we interact, how we talk about those things can, can matter, uh, how they get interrelated and how they're different. Uh, but also, I'm going to talk about how polyamory today is, uh, the way it's moving, is very pushing it to be egalitarian. So this is one thing that distinguishes it uh, from uh, polygamy, for example, uh, being in the Mormon state. Uh, it's a relevant topic. Um, well, like the girls get to do it too, right? So uh, it, it's got to be equal. Uh, and I, I had this one time I was uh, when I moved into my apartment in Stockton. Uh, my apartment manager uh, got to talk about relationships, and I said I was polyamorous. And he said, "What's that?" And I said, "What's ethical non-monogamy?" He said, "What's that?" And I said, "Like, well, um, I have multiple girlfriends simultaneously, and uh, they all know about it, and they're all cool with it." And, and he says, "Wow, that's really awesome. How do I be? How do I convince my wife to be polyamorous?" <laughs> and I said, "Well." Uh, you do realize, of course, that they get to do it too. And then he's like, oh, I don't know now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could have turned him around on that. I could have convinced him that it's actually cool to, to be equal around it. Uh, but the point being is that it's egalitarian. Uh, everybody has the same rights, the same opportunities. That's what makes it different from polygamy, which is and ultimately turns into an abusive relationship. Uh, another aspect of polyamory is integration of gays and lesbians into the movement. Um, you will often find, if you know polyamorists, many polyamorous relationships will have in their polycule, which polycule means that all the people who are connected to each other through relationships one way or another, um, will have gay people, bi people, and trans people, and so on, uh, all in there. Uh, and they're all practicing not ethical monogamy. And so you'll have, for example, you can have a woman living with two bisexual men, and they have basically a three-way relationship. Uh, that's the sort of thing that can happen. You can be aware of that. Once you're in the poly community, you find this is fairly normal and happens a lot. Uh, not that specific thing, but other arrangements. Now, in reality, statistics show uh, nearly half of all people are non-monogamous in practice. Um, a lot of people are cheating out there. Uh, most just don't practice it ethically. Uh, this is the important thing to point out. Now, I think even most of the remaining half would probably also be non-monogamous if it were accepted or even promoted, and there were a lot of opportunities. Um, but that requires making it ethical. So let's get to ethical non-monogamy. Ethical non-monogamy means with honesty, respect, and the consent of all in all. Uh, that's where the ethics come from right there. Now, polyamory is one major kind of ethical non-monogamy. Uh, it means not just sexual freedom, but romantic freedom as well. Uh, so the word literally means many loves. Uh, but the point is you're allowed not merely to have multiple sexual partners, but you're allowed to care about your sexual partners and spend resources on them like time, money, and emotional labor, the same as you would for your friends and family. And you notice even monogamous relationships already let you do this with friends and family. The only thing that polyamory sometimes often adds to the thing is that you're just having sex with some of these people, hopefully not your family, but uh, friends. <laughs> polyamory can also be practiced non-sexually, um, but that's not usually the thing that shocks people, uh, so I'll be focusing on sexual polyamory. Um, although polyamory in the asexual community is actually a whole other thing I need to talk about. Uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, the sexual polyamory. And as such, um, its added component is the allowance of love and romance on top of sexual freedom. Um, other kinds of ethical non-monogamy include swinging, uh, where you might have sex with someone else, but you're not allowed to have a relationship with them beyond that. Um, also, temporary hall passes. Uh, you know, if, uh, if a guy gives his wife, okay, if you've got two weeks, you can do whatever you want, just don't tell me what happened. Uh, that happens, as long as it's ethical and everybody agrees to it. I still think there are problems with some of those kinds of arrangements, but uh, that gets into the 201 uh, panel when I'm just doing the one-on-one -on -one today. Um, or open marriages that allow sexual but not romantic freedom. Um, I'll only be talking about polyamory from here on out. 
uh, or poly for short. Uh, but everything I say does apply to all ethical non-monogamy, even the ability to uh, criticize in ethical terms some other forms of ethical non-monogamy. Polyamory itself also has kinds, right? Some of those kinds include polyfidelity, uh, which is where you have several people in a relationship of some form or structure, and they agree not to have date outside of that. Uh, so they're being uh, faithful to each other in that unit. Um, that's one form of poly polyamory. Um, more commonly, as polyamory, where it's more of an open arrangement. Uh, and there's different kinds of that. There's solo poly, uh, which is what I'm practicing right now, where uh, my primary partner is me, uh, in the sense that I live alone, uh, and um, I, I date people in a circle around me. I don't have any particular anchor partner. Um, versus the other kind, which is uh, commonly anchor coupling. Uh, usually it's centered around a couple, sometimes it's a triad, which is three people in a relationship together. Uh, you are even living together. Um, I know, for example, uh, one triad where it's two women, one man, uh, they all share a bed, they all share kids, they all take care of the kids together, and they all live together. Um, that's an example. Uh, and that's the kind of thing where you have that kind of situation, those are your anchor partners around whom you organize your life, and they're usually the, the first people who get first priority on, on depending on your time and everything. And then there will be other hierarchical structures that some polyamorous uh, groups will create for themselves, we term them secondaries and tertiaries. Secondaries people you date regularly, tertiaries people that might float in and out of the relationship uh, from time to time. Now there are also polyamorists who are anti-hierarchy, uh, say that there's actually something unethical about creating hierarchies. Uh, and this is a debate going on in the community, and it's actually a healthy and interesting debate because there are you know, correct points on both sides, I think, and it's a very interesting thing to watch it happen. Um, but, uh, for example, the anti-hierarchy uh, polyamorists think you're, there's an ethical issue regarding respecting the feelings and autonomy of your partner's partners, right? It's not just a question of, oh, we're, we're, it's us against the world, but also the people that you're having loving relationships with, they also have a say in things, they also have feelings to consider and so on. Uh, and uh, hierarchy can sometimes mess with that. And a good example of this is the veto rule, uh, which I think is increasingly becoming unpopular uh, in polyamory. Um, it's certainly written against by most of the thought leaders in the polyamory movement now. But this is the idea where uh, if you have to say you're a couple, you're a married couple, you decide to open, you decide to be polyamorous, and but you say, well, one, one rule we have veto power. Like uh, the husband gets to veto any partner at any time that the, that the woman takes and vice versa. Now the problem with this is, let's suppose if you can do that, uh, uh, she goes and falls in love with the guy, they have a, a, they have a really uh, close relationship, and then her husband gets scared by that and vetoes it, and basically forces them to break up. Um, this is actually unethical, uh, and you can make the case that it's unethical. So there are, these are the kinds of things where we're having debates as to whether, uh, which rules are allowable, or whether we should have rules, how the rules should be defined. There's this whole context of discussing uh, the morality and constructing the morality of polyamory that's still going on and hasn't been you know, ironed out in every detail yet. Um, and then there's, of course, the difference between enforced versus de facto hierarchies. Uh, enforced hierarchy is where you say, well, this is my primary, you're my secondary, these are the, uh, the order of things. A de facto hierarchy is when you just happen to date one person more than another, uh, or happen to live with someone. This creates sort of de facto realities that you can't get around. Um, so there are many different ways that polyamory gets practiced. Um, there's different aspects of uh, quad structures, triad structures. Um, you can have, for example, a triad that also sometimes dates casually outside of the triad, but the triad and the three people are the, the core of the relationship. Um, and you can have more complicated things like that. You can have a household of five people who have interchanging uh, relationships. So um, there are many different ways that polyamory can be organized, and there's lots written about this online, thanks to that. But the whole central idea of it is that it's ethical, um, meaning honest and open and with everybody's consent. Uh, you're, no, you're not doing sneaking around. Now the values of polyamorous people, the values that polyamorous people advocate, are fully consistent and even in fact in some ways inform humanist values. Um, the poly community is engaged in a humanist project, in fact, of building a whole new evidence-based moral system. Uh, I think humanists actually have a lot to learn from that. Um, relationship ethics is no longer about justifying traditional values and habitual or customary ways of doing things or thinking about them. The basic principle of polyamory is this. It's that people get to negotiate the kind of relationship they want. Uh, they don't have to follow a prepackaged script of how a relationship is supposed to go, how you're supposed to behave. Um, we throw that out and say, you know what, just ask for what you want and see if that's what they want. And if you can compromise, you can compromise. Every uh, individual in this arrangement can actually negotiate what works for them, and if it doesn't work for them, they cannot enter the relationship, for example. 
Now this creates, because it's not the way we've done it before, uh, this creates social issues that come up, different kinds of ethical problems that were not faced uh, by monogamy, although monogamy created all of its own kind of ethical problems that people had to deal with. The point being is that now we have to assemble a new ethical system for how to conduct relationships, and the polyamorous community is doing this as we speak. Um, there are other aspects of this. Um, not just being able to negotiate the kind of relationships you want. That's one dimension. Uh, that's the freedom aspect of it. The philosophical dimension is polyamory, the polyamorous community is also asking people to actually think about why they want those things, what they're asking for, and whether they even should. Because in fact, monogamy culture, religious shame culture, certain other kinds of personal fears and other things may drive you to think you want something, when in fact, if you just let go of certain fears and certain insecurities, what you would want is something quite different. Uh, so having people think about and actually analyze themselves, why do you want the things that you want? And if you think about them, do you want them anymore? Maybe you, you have to analyze it, you, you realize that you want something else, uh, or that you don't want those things anymore. So thinking about what it is you want out of a relationship, why do you want certain things out of a relationship, uh, getting people to think about that is actually a really healthy and productive thing. Normally people just get into relationships because they assume that certain things are supposed to be desired, certain things are supposed to be achieved. They don't stop and think about, you know, what actually is it that, why do I date people? Uh, why do I have anyone in my life at all? What, what, what do I get out of it? What's the purpose of it? This kind of philosophical exercise is like. Now, humanism and polyamory go together because their values are actually the same. Uh, compassion, reason, respecting consent, and autonomy. And polyamory needs humanism because though there are polyamorists who are atheists, humanists, and skilled skeptics, in fact, um, that's more common in the atheist community, humanist community, than it is in, for example, Christianity, uh, but there are also polyamorists who are religious or woo. Uh, there's a lot of uh, pseudoscience that sometimes crops up in these, uh, that kind of thing. And we need the counterbalancing voice of reason and secularism more. We have science-based perspective. So for us to enter the polyamory community in greater numbers and talking about these things, we can actually lead it in a good direction, in a more humanist direction. Uh, and there are already uh, people who are humanists and atheists who are already doing this, uh, but the more the better. Now morality, Generally, the humanist perspective is that a morality is about harm reduction. Um, there's the, the Wiccan credo, so long as none be harmed, do as he will. Uh, the humanists also sort of adopt something similar to that. And if morality is based on harm reduction, and there's no gods or traditions or metaphysical realities that can tell you what's right or wrong, how to do that, you have to look at science, you have to look at reason, you have to look at evidence, and you have to actually use reason and compassion to determine what your values should be. If you decide, like, you know, it should be about harm reduction, I shouldn't do so much harm in the world. Uh, once you've made that decision, it's evidence-based reasoning from there on out. Rather than tradition, rather than just doing what people told you you're supposed to do, or saying, well, we've always done it that way. Um, no. Humanists fight against the claim that that's just how everyone does things, and so do polyamorous. Now, polyamory advances the notion that what's important about a relationship is how well it works for the people who are in it not that it follows some preordained course. And that's a humanist perspective, if there was one. They are walking the walk of humanist values, actually applying evidence-based and harm-reductive egalitarian reasoning to tear down obsolete traditions and build a more, uh, more fully ethical society. But more than that, polyamory is also discovering and writing about and exploring new humanist values. There's a word they invented called compersion. How many people have heard that word? We have a few people, yeah. Um, this is something that I'm surprised that humanists weren't on before. Uh, compersion is uh, the opposite of jealousy. Compersion is when you actually feel joy and pleasure at your partner's receiving joy and pleasure from someone else or from something else, uh, or even from something that you do, but also if they're with another partner and you're happy for them, um, you get that, that feeling of joy and happiness for them, that's compersion. Uh, and what Paul Amherst have been doing, not only they coined the word and they're talking about this concept as a thing that exists that they're experiencing, they're talking about how that actually integrates into a complete picture of your moral values, about how you should approach life and how you should look at and treat other people, especially people close to you. Now, humanists, I think, should be talking about this value as well, even outside the context of sex and relationships. Polyamorists are already doing this, uh, and so there's actually stuff that humanists can learn from the polyamorous community. Uh, they're discovering new ways to look at human ethics, that, uh, a new uh, phenomena of human moral uh, experience that the humanists have overlooked before. Um, in addition to that, uh, polyamory advocates, as well as also I should mention the kink community. Um, there's, at the same time, there's been a rise of discussion of ethics in the kink community that is also quite interesting and informative. 
Uh, but they both place a strong value on and actually practice communication and negotiation in a way that is often underemphasized and underpracticed even within humanism. So humanists actually have something to learn from looking at the way you're doing that. Okay, you know, can we expand this attitude, this ethic of communication and negotiation to other areas of human life? Will that make humanity better? Um, I think it will. Now, of course, as I mentioned before, gender equality is also a lead vanguard in both humanism and polyamory. This is where the history of non, or, sorry, history of monogamy becomes relevant again. Uh, I gave a talk called Sex and Sexism in Ancient Rome uh, for the Poly Columbus Society uh, a while ago. Uh, you can find that video online. There's also a full transcript uh, for those who prefer to read and uh, watch, um, where I talk about, in fact, where monogamy comes from. Um, it actually comes from the Romans. Um, you might be surprised to learn. Uh, now the reality is that marriage was not an innate, does not appear to have been an innate thing to the human tribes. Marriage was something that started to be invented as property started to be invented as a thing. It is not an accident that they arose at the same time. Uh, women's labor and their wombs were literally regarded as property to own. Uh, and this is actually what marriage really was about. Marriage contracts were about who owns that womb, and it wasn't the woman. Now, monogamy, you might be surprised, did not come from Christianity, technically, or even Judaism. In fact, Judaism allowed men to have many wives and concubines and sex lives. Even men hiring a prostitute was not prohibited as long as she wasn't Jewish. Um, <laughs> only women were forbidden to be non-monogamous. It's important to point that out. Only women uh, were insisted upon being monogamous. Pagan culture had a similar system, uh, and it wasn't religious-based either. It was a secular system. Uh, men could only marry one wife, but they could have it as many girlfriends and mistresses as they wanted, as well as sex slaves and legal access to prostitutes. They were only forbidden from deflowering elite virgins and having sex with other men's wives. So in fact, monogamy was about controlling women as property. Uh, it's about who owns that womb, who has access to that womb. In fact, the word adultery comes literally from adulterating a womb with alien seed, uh, or putting at risk or, or actually doing so. Uh, it's all about the damn womb. Uh, it wasn't about sex so much as who owns that womb and what it can produce. And as I mentioned in the ancient system, the original monogamy system that was invented, the woman didn't own her own womb. Um, restricting women's sexuality was also in part based on toxic masculinity of the time. A woman having sex with another man was an insult to the power and manhood of the man who owned her. But even that was about making women into property, right? So thus even, women were forced to be monogamous while men were not. Now what happened is, so this, we still have monogamy. Monogamy existed, it was just women were forced to be monogamous. I mean, women had to be monogamous, men not. What Christians did is they took this system over and began suppressing all sexuality. And they extended monogamy expectations and laws to cover men as well as women. Now, you might think, well, isn't that egalitarian? But in point of fact, I suspect, the danger of straying men was that it empowered women. Uh, hence the demonization of the harlot. Um, why is a harlot a threat? Well, she's an independent woman who can command the resources of multiple men. You can't have that. Uh, and we see this when we look at the history of non-monogamy and monogamy in ancient Rome, when men would actually take mistresses. Oftentimes, they would even find expensive uh, hetaira and companions, as they were called, um, high-end prostitutes, that they could actually get uh, contracts of exclusive or near exclusive access to uh, for a fee. Um, and I, we have an example of one of these contracts where the woman says, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to hire myself out to one guy, I might do two. And so two guys had to dicker over uh, uh, the arrangement. So they basically, they, they, the two men themselves shared this one particular woman. But this is an example of, uh, and these women also were empowered in other ways, even though they were socially stigmatized and uh, deprivated, their privileges taken away legally in many respects, they were allowed to do this, and they had total sexual freedom, unlike other women in their class, or other women in that society. Christians didn't like this. Uh, when you have women who can do this, who can stand outside the system and actually make decisions as to who gets to have sex with them and when and for what, um, uh, that's too much power for women to have. So uh, restricting men's uh, sexuality is a way of actually disempowering women. But of course, it also ends up hurting men as well. Now, I mentioned before that the Christian worldview was built on the belief that women were to be subservient to men uh, and in providing labor, sex, and children. In exchange for which, of course, the men were expected to provide women means and protection and quote-unquote better judgment. Um, yes, that was the typical view that women had bad judgment, men had good judgment, therefore it makes sense that a woman should be under a to a man because, you know, she needs someone to correct her mistakes. 
But the basic idea is men are on top, men are in the key, women stay home and raise the kids. Now, when that Christian model of monogamy failed in the early 20th century, and it did, secular culture tried to retool monogamy into a quote-unquote romance of equals narrative. The, the idea of what we think of monogamy today is actually less than 100 years old. Um, it, monogamy throughout the reign of Christianity in the last 2,000 years has always been about ownership and property uh, of women. Um, I'm sorry, property and ownership of women. But it got retooled, right? So the, the secular culture tried to reinvent uh, monogamy into something else. Uh, not intelligently, no one sat down and said, this is how we're going to do it. It's just sort of the way it evolved. Those people sort of rebelled against uh, this, the kind of stupid concepts at the time. And, but they still had this monogamy thing that they want to keep around. Now, I think they should have scrapped the whole thing. Uh, but the Overton window was placed over all the tropes of monogamy. Uh, again, the harlot trope uh, and jealousy is justified by possession and so on. Uh, there are many aspects of how the, these values and ideas had seeped through the culture so that it wasn't even conceivable to actually get rid of monogamy altogether. So that, in fact, only the quote-unquote romance of equals revision had a chance at obtaining begrudging respectability, um, and it did, but that's a talk for a different time. I'm not going to go further into that. Now, gender equality is now the main goal of polyamory, or one of the main goals, just as it is in humanism. Uh, gender equality is fundamental to polyamory. Uh, the women get to do it too. Uh, but we also find now is that polyamory as an ethical movement, as an intellectual movement, is largely driven by women uh, who want their autonomy back. Uh, the majority of poly community leadership is comprised of women. The majority of the top thought leaders are women. Uh, not exclusively, but the majority. Now, monogamy has been, and in many ways, still is used to subordinate women. Uh, so polyamory is actually a part of the liberation of women in that narrative. But even the revamp of a romance of equals form of monogamy subordinates women's autonomy. Uh, that it does so by equally subordinating men's autonomy is seen as somehow a good thing. Um, it's at least equal. Uh, when in fact, two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, but in actual practice, also, latent sexism in our culture makes even a romance of equals a de facto gender hierarchy. Um, where the man in the relationship has powers and privileges, the woman doesn't. But even if that weren't the case, sacrificing yourself for others' needs to have, or sacrificing yourself for others in certain ways, sacrificing your happiness for others in certain ways, needs to have a purpose. And when examined with the sacrifices of monogamy, you might look at it and realize that it doesn't really have a justifying purpose except to perpetuate itself. We can debate that, but that's also a talk for another time. This, though, gets me to my last point for today. Uh, combating prejudice against and hostility toward ethical non-monogamy is as much a humanist cause as doing so for homophobia, transphobia, and opposition to non-marital sex or single motherhood, like I said. Monogamy is maintained not just by Christianity and other sexually suppressing religions, but by a Christian-made sexual culture. We are taught to assume certain, certain things are true, certain things about jealousy, for example, or what's taboo or normal for a couple to do, and how people are to be judged for their sexual choices. Those assumptions came from Christianity, but they are still transmitted within sexual secular culture. So this is actually, in fact, a social justice issue. Freedom from religion and its influence on culture that perpetuates injustices within society actually includes the orbit of polyamory as a problem. The way religion has infected how we think of sex and relationships is also something we need to look at and fix in ourselves and in society. But let's look at the analogy of atheists versus polyamorous. Just like atheists, polyamorists face bigotry and prejudice and an uncooperative culture that doesn't recognize them. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm dating someone in Southern California. Now, this is Southern California. You might think a really liberal place. Uh, she's poly, uh, and she's married, and they're raising a kid, and they live together in the whole thing. And they're both polyamorous, and they have uh, partners outside uh, the marriage. But she can't be out. Uh, to the parental community within her school system, her daughter is still young. Because not only would that bring down, because that's judged, people look at that and go, oh, this, uh, this, this harlot who's uh, running around with her husband kind of thing. Um, people assume that makes her an unfit parent, uh, or make, make her husband an unfit parent. And so their, their fear, and there have been occasions throughout, uh, throughout the country where this has actually happened, is that people will punish them socially for that uh, in various ways. Um, or even call social services on them. Uh, and if you live in an area where social services doesn't know what polyamory is or have any respect for it, you actually could lose your children or actually end up in an expensive legal battle for them all over this, uh, this idea that somehow being polyamorous makes you a bad parent. Uh, and incidentally, by the way, the science is in, it doesn't. Uh, I've blogged about that. So, uh, 
So this is this is the kind. This is just one example of many aspects of how there is prejudice and bigotry against polyamorists that is similar to the current bigotry and prejudice against atheists, and that we should be aware of that and not allow that to be. Uh, we should criticize that. We should uh, uh, ourselves certainly not participate in it. Uh, we should be helping to promote the view that polyamory is just as acceptable as atheism uh, and should not be treated these ways. Um, and of course, there are many other examples of women who are polyamorous being treated as sluts and therefore uh, people care less about whether they can be sexually harassed uh, or relentlessly asked out because obviously they're sleeping with everybody, so surely they're available. Um, that's the kind of attitude we also want to combat. And remember again that slut trope is a means of disempowering women. Uh, by attacking and dehumanizing and socially demoting and punishing women who are independent and liberated from male control and capable of commanding the resources of multiple men, including their resources of time and emotional labor. Um, so you've got to think about that uh, when you're talking about promiscuous women, especially if uh, they have multiple loving relationships, uh, that's actually a position of power uh, to be in, uh, normally a position that men have enjoyed throughout history. There's also uh, negative tropes targeted at men who are polyamorous, uh, denounced as cheaters or abusers. Uh, the most common one that I hear is uh, that, oh, obviously uh, your, your wife is not agreeing with what you're, what you're doing. Um, you're just forcing her to do this. Uh, and then you go talk to her and she's having a great time with multiple boyfriends. And I'm like, okay, so maybe not. Um, now that's not to say that there isn't abuse within polyamory. You can end up in an abusive relationship in poly just as easily as you can in monogamy. Um, so poly doesn't solve that problem. Uh, but it, it's, you know, this is not the affirming the consequent fallacy. Just because that can happen doesn't mean that uh, all poly relationships are like that. Now, so I think in general, watch yourself. Uh, whenever you think, for example, that, uh, and I haven't brought up sex workers, but I could have done a whole talk on that too. Whenever you think a sex worker or any promiscuous woman or man is any different from someone who works as a personal chef or who goes dancing with different friends on different nights. Um, if you think there's some fundamental difference between those two things, you have something you need to fix. You've got that Christian culture stuck in your head. If you think sex is worse or more shocking than those things, you have been infected by this Christian anti-sex culture. Uh, you want to cure that. And humanism is a cure for that, by the way. So, uh, at least it's part of the process to cure. Now, the last thing I want to mention is um, another thing I've encountered, which is fears of polyamory. Now, they stem in part from being programmed by monogamy culture and thus having false beliefs about what polyamory means or what, if we put that life would be like. But uh, the fears of polyamory also stem in part from the threat that a liberated society poses to those who want to maintain the status quo. Uh, for example, uh, accepting the company of atheists. Let's use the analogy of atheists again. Accepting the company of atheists, have, being friends with them, uh, voting for them, uh, having them be your boss or your employee, um, letting them teach your kids, uh, allowing them to be out and open. All of these things threatens Christianity because it reminds people they don't have to be Christians. Uh, and it actually gives them role models to say, you know what, this guy's this girl, this guy, they're pretty nice, they're atheists, why do I need to be a Christian anymore? Uh, in, in addition to that, it also exposes them to easier access to asking why atheists are atheists and thus finding out, and thus leaving Christianity. Um, so atheists being out, atheists writing, atheists being accepted, allowing atheists to even touch and, or be in possession or presence of and uh, talking with uh, people you know is a threat. Um, so it has to be, therefore, shameful to talk about atheism in public or associate with atheists. Uh, atheists have to be punished, so you get threats, um, killing their pets, which has happened, uh, child service calls, even uh, atheists can't be fit parents, um, firing them or not hiring them, um, these kinds of things that people run into all the time, making, or even just making them feel unwelcome. Uh, these kinds of things, these kinds of petty ways of trying to get atheists out of your social circle to prevent them from infecting the rest of your social circle because you don't want anyone else, your friends or family, to be atheists. Now, polyamory is punished in the exact same way and for the exact same reason, uh, in all the same ways that sometimes threats, but certainly the child service calls, firing them or not hiring them, making them feel unwelcome, all that thing, excluding them from the company. Um, I'll give you an example that happened literally just yesterday. Um, I gave my talk in Reno, and after, afterwards I was doing the book signing, and uh, this guy came up to me and says, you know, I really wanted to talk to you about polyamory, but my wife said I wasn't allowed to. She said he wasn't allowed to just talk about polyamory with me. Um, I could sense in that that she was afraid that if he talked to someone who was polyamorous, he might think, you know what, maybe I want to be polyamorous too, and that becomes a threat to her. Uh, and so there's, this is where a lot of the, um, the fear of polyamory comes from, this threat. Now, the, 
the analogy, though, does uh, point out that the fear is justified. Um, but the point is, that doesn't mean the reaction to it is moral. So the same thing, though, accepting the company of polyamorists, having them as your friends, uh, accepting open discussion and allowing social acceptance of polyamory. That means their presence will remind your own spouse or partner that that's an option and an acceptable one at that. Or talking to them or seeing how normal and happy they are, just like atheists, might convince your spouse or partner to want their freedom too. Or it might, for example, as happened, you know, the last generation might make them realize, you know, I think I'm gay. Uh, being out about uh, homosexuality, uh, accepting homosexuality. A lot, of, a lot of people come out of the closet. A lot of those people happen to be married to uh, opposite sex partners. Uh, that was a problem. People got through it. Uh, but that was the reality. That's what should have happened. So, the point being though, to defend your exclusive sexual and romantic rights to someone, you have to attack and denigrate and punish polyamorists the same way as that Christians do atheists and for the same reason. And that means it's true, if you have a monogamous relationship, it's almost certain, I'm sorry to say, it's almost certain that you've never actually got their consent to it. Uh, because when you made the agreement to be monogamous, they didn't know there were options and what they were like. It was kept from them, not by you necessarily, but by society in general. Just as atheism as an option, what it is like to live as an atheist, is kept from churchgoers, because they too might leave when they find out. Wanting to control your partner by restricting their access to knowledge and punishing other people that do it is thus just like churches wanting to control their congregations by restricting their access to knowledge and punishing other people to do it. So polyamory is scary uh, for that reason, just like being an atheist is scary, and for all the same reasons. Now I'll also add that it's scary even for someone considering atheism or polyamory. At least if you're religious and you're thinking about, gosh, maybe there's no God. Uh, or you're thinking, gosh, maybe I don't like what I'm so much. Christians have all sorts of false beliefs about how miserable they will be if they become an atheist. If you've ever talked to a Christian or an ex-Christian, they'll tell you about how they had all these horrible fears about uh, how awful being an atheist was. Then they become an atheist and discover those were all misplaced fears, that life as an atheist was just as fulfilling and in many cases even more so. It is certainly more free and self determining Now the same is true of monogamists. They have a lot of fear-based false beliefs about polyamory which if they do poly, they find those are misplaced fears often, that in life, uh, that life in polyamory can be just as fulfilling and in many cases even more so. Now of course, polyamory can also present many of the same problems as monogamy, including abuse and people that you love leaving you. Uh, polyamory does not necessarily secure you a guaranteed access to a person. But monogamy doesn't solve those problems either. And polyamory relationship skills, by the way, how not to have bad poly experiences, especially if you're new to polyamory, I have a lot to say on that too, uh, but that's a whole other topic. Uh, I'm going to end there and turn it over to Q and A. So thank you. All right, do we have questions? No questions. <laughs> Being expected to be the top provider uh, for a family just puts you under tremendous stress, right? Um, and that, I think, there's solutions to that even within monogamy. Um, but you know, polyamory can also solve that because you can distribute uh, your, your requirements amongst a larger group. Um, there's examples of someone who doesn't want to keep relying on one person because they're going to burn out uh, on, for emotional labor or for resources or anything like that. They have multiple people they can distribute. Uh, demands upon, it becomes a lighter burden, uh, and so the, the stress is less. Um, so I don't know if there's statistics showing that, though. Uh, <laughs> in reality, though, uh, suicide rate is much higher for men in general, uh, and this, I think, ties a lot into there are huge expectations placed on men because they're expected to be in charge and on top and all of this stuff. Um, there's certain, this, this whole idea of what makes a man that's actually toxic and harmful to men. Uh, it was put there, actually, ultimately, to control women, but it ends up growing in men under as well. Uh, so uh, I think a lot of that has to be fought as well, but that's a whole other discussion. Yeah? Do you think that uh, 
there are people that are more wired one way or the other as far as monogamous, non-monogamous, poly. I would love to know the answer to that question. Uh, we need science. Um, there's actually a lot of science that needs to be done on polyamory. Some of it is starting to be done now. Um, like I mentioned, there, are, there have been studies done of poly, children in polyamorous families, for example. There have been studies of jealousy and things like that. Uh, a lot of those studies are terrible evil side crap, but uh, uh, some of it, um, some of it has been good stuff, uh, or it's useful even when it's bad. Um, but I would like to see that because, I, I mean, I suspect, no, it's highly unlikely that there would be any gene that, that affects your decision as to how many people you fall in love with. I mean, that, that seems highly unlikely to me. Um, so what would be more likely is you're going to you're going to vary in the population among certain needs. So uh, you'll have the asexual to sexual spectrum, right? So asexual, hypersexual spectrum. So some people need more sexual relationships than others simply because they're more sexual people. Um, but you, have, you find even in the asexual community an interest in polyamory because sex isn't always about love, right? Um, sex and love can be separate things, and so. Um, then it becomes a question of why are we restricting how many people we can love? We don't do that for families or friends. Uh, and so that we don't see in a community like there's people who are genetically predisposed to only have one friend. Um, so I think it's highly unlikely that people are genetically predisposed to be monogamous. I think monogamy is imposed on people. Uh, it, they're trained to think that way, and oftentimes people can't get out of that thinking. And a lot of it is based on you know, fear insecurities, for example, thinking like, I need to secure one person, I need to do whatever I can to prevent them from leaving. Uh, and it's this kind of self-generating perspective that culture feeds people in terms of how they are supposed to get around. Um, uh, one metamor of mine, which is a, a boyfriend date of one of my girlfriends, uh, called this a, um, I think he said, a, a deprivation economy of, 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 of but not that monogamy creates. It creates this idea that you have one slot that you can fill. You can have as many friends as you want. You can have all the, the kids you want, all the parents and, and aunts and uncles you want. But for, for a sexual relationship and for a loving, that kind of intimate relationship, you have one slot you're allowed to fill. So it creates this sort of panic that you want to try and fill that slot and lock it down. Um, and also it's a lot of work to find someone to fill that slot. And that's, oh, it's nice to just have it filled and not have to do any of that work anymore. Um, so there are a lot of these basic psychological things that lead people to be comfortable rolling in that rut. But I think these are created by a culture that is sort of making it easy to do that, rather than a culture that supports doing something else. Uh, and so I think if we had a culture that supported polyamory, I think polyamory would be far more common. And the only people who would be monogamous would be people who just didn't need other partners, and they wouldn't place any demands on their, their partners to be monogamous. Uh, so I think that ultimately, if we're looking at 100, 500 years from now, I think you know, the, the most advanced societies will be like that, where there'll be individuals who decide whether they'll be monogamous just for themselves, but won't be imposing monogamy on anyone else that's, that they're connected to. Um, so I think that's what's most likely going to fall out if, if we just had uh, a, a human rational based, um, a humanist rational based culture and our underlying genes. Um, of course, 500 years now we'll have changed our genes, so who knows? <laughs> yeah. So I, I realize this is actually going to look like I'm asking a question about myself. I don't care about that, but I, I'm, 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 curi I'm curious about if we were to posit a relationship where a, a monogamous couple with children that have been together for a long time under the sort of standard rules of marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if one of them proposes non-monogamy uh, as, as, a, as a new uh, mode in their marriage and the other is against it, what, talk, talk a little bit about the ethics of that. And, and how, yeah, how that's a difficult that. situation. No, first of all, there's no generic answer to that because there are many factors that will be specific to that couple. Um, so you have this. One thing that's been pointed out, I think, in, in couples therapy multiple times is you have one issue that creates a divide in the relationship. Oftentimes, that's the tip of an iceberg of a whole bunch of other issues uh, that you really should, you should sort those out first. Um, so I think uh, the reality of that is complex and requires specific uh, address. And normally, when someone asks me that question, or if, if it was someone who actually was in that situation asking that question, what I tell them is find a polyamory-friendly couples therapist, someone who's actually licensed uh, and is poly-friendly, and then go talk to them and that. Because what then what they'll do is they'll ask you questions about your specific relationship, your specific partner, and so on. And we'll be able to tell you what your options are and, and your, what your situation is and how to handle it. Um, that would be my recommendation because that's the much better way. There's no one simple philosophical solution to that problem. Um, yeah, so that, that's really all I can say on that. Yeah. <clears throat>
for <coughs> assistance along that line, the local community in Utah, the biggest one is the Utah Blind Ever Society, mm -hmm. has a whole collection of documents and various bits of information called Poly Armory. And we specifically do have a list of poly friendly therapists. That's outstanding, yes. Which is a thing that I think humanists can help us do everywhere. I think we should have that. that. That needs to be more widely done. Just as we have, we're growing a network of uh, atheists, secular friendly therapists, because that's often an issue as well. Um, Daryl Ray has been uh, part of uh, making that happen. So, uh, what was it? It was uh, poly, what was the, the Utah Polyamory Society. The Utah Polyamory Society. And there, there are a number of other groups, um, dating groups and activity groups and things like that that are smaller. There are mm -hmm. recurring monthly events, there are support meetings, there are socials. Um, I've heard recurring, it. This sounds awesome. So. Six recurring uh, events every month, I believe. And the, that's other, the other groups have recurring events as well. Yeah, that's, that's cool. So those of you here who have these kinds of questions, it looks, sounds like there's a community here you can call upon as well. Um, and, and like she said, there's a, they, all have, they have a list um, that they monitor that of poly-friendly therapists that you can talk to. Um, yes? Uh, since Utah has a, a love-hate relationship with polygamy, uh, <laughs> yeah. they actually love their ancestors that lived polygamy, but they hate their neighbors that live polygamy. <laughs> Uh, so do you see Utah as, as, as far as polyamory, that the field is white and ready to harvest because or it's more likely that it's kind of harder here to accept, have acceptance because of the history and the rejection of polygamy than other locations? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, as, as a historian, I know how I would attack that problem, uh, but it would require skills and time that I have devoted to the problem. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, we'll find out, uh, frankly. Yeah. Uh, yes? Do you think that your that economic influences are <coughs> having anything to do with the rise in polyamory, with um, people's financial statuses going down, having a bigger community to work I, together? I don't think so, although poly communities are starting to use polyamory as a tool to, con to, to uh, deal with that problem. What I think has been a bigger motivating factor is the liberation of women in the workforce. The more financially independent women become, the more they can start asking, like, why do we even want one dude? Why, why can't I have multiple guys? You know, because um, it's based on this whole model you're supposed to get a man and he takes care of you. That's a dead model, right? The Christians are still pushing it. Uh, but that's the, the idea, even Disney still sort of reinforces that idea that there's this one magic guy who's gonna come and take you away and, and everything will be happy and wonderful after. Um, um, and so there are these ways that are reinforcing it, but I think once women became not only uh, more financially independent, but also uh, more access to education, uh, so they're more literate and so on, um, and, and have more knowledge and more access to knowledge, uh, this I think has driven polyamory as of the rise of it. That's why I think a lot of the, the thought leaders and a lot of the first movers on this are women, like the ethical slut goes way back, uh, and that was written by a woman, for example. Um, so I think, uh, I think, and of course there, there's a history of this that goes all the way back to the failed experiments of the 60s in terms of free love and things, and then there was the 70s swinger thing. That, so that there have been like these sort of fits and starts of sort of these failed attempts to do this. Uh, but I think it's only really taken off and then it become a successful out thing and started talking about the ethics of the thing as a, as a thing to have a debate about and, and talk about evidence-based morality of it. That only started happening when you had uh, leaders, most of the women, actually writing books about it and actually having conferences and, and, and meetups and things like that. Um, and so I think it's mostly been driven by the liberation of women uh, in reality. But I think what you're saying, I think the, the, the idea of uh, the, the, the huge economic disparity that's growing, uh, that's leaving more people in bad situations, uh, I think we have under-exploited polyamory as a solution to that problem. Uh, I wrote a whole blog about this, actually. There are actually more models for how to uh, survive as a single mother, for example, than polyamory or monogamy. Those are even the only two options, and of course our society is only selling them monogamy as the option. Uh, especially states that restrict abortion access, they're trying to sort of force them, you're either going to be miserable or you're going to get a husband. This is how it's going to be. Um, which I find interesting that they regard having kids as a punishment and then turn around and say hey, everything is about having kids and aren't they wonderful. Um, but no, if we had a society that would uh, teach people that there's multiple ways to do this, extended family model used to be the way 100 years ago. Uh, where you would just live at home and you'd have multiple aunts and uncles and sisters and stuff taking care of your kids. Um, that was normal. Uh, we've kind of gotten away from that. This idea of pushing a nuclear family model has actually left people under-resourced. 
um, having uh, actually platonic relationships. You have two single mothers moving in together, and then if we had, especially if we created legal instruments that empowered them, uh, they could work as mutual guardians of their respective children. And it's not a sexual relationship, they'll date people outside of it, uh, but it's just a parental relationship. And I think this might happen ultimately that we're actually going to separate parental relationships with from sexual and romantic relationships so that marriage won't be this omnibus. Uh, and they'll just be, oh, we're, we're, we're now in a parental agreement, and that's it. Uh, as far as romance, it's a whole separate thing. Um, that's what I see happening in the future, ultimately. Uh, but these are things that we have to make happen. Uh, and they're slowly sort of starting to happen, but they, uh, they're, they're reactive. They're happening in reaction to what's going on economically. Yeah. Europe is generally ahead of the United States in terms of being less prudish, less sexist, less religious. Is it also ahead of the United States just demographically in terms of being more polyamorous? Uh, I don't really answer that question. I haven't looked at the statistics. I don't even know if there are any yet. This is another thing we want is more stats. We want more data. Um, regarding European polyamory. Um, UK, I know a lot more about UK polyamory, but I don't know in terms of scale. Um, I know that it exists, I know they have groups and, and organizations and so on, and that it's a thing there. Uh, and it has somewhat more acceptance than in most American states. Um, but, uh, apparently even in Southern California. Um, but I don't know about other countries, for example, Germany, Italy, even Spain, and so on. So, um, I don't know how to answer that question yet. Um, could you... It, it's kind of a step back, but can, could you speculate on a correlation between um, the personality trait of openness to experience mm -hmm. and uh, like a scale between jealousy and compression? Ah, um, well, those are two different things, right? Right. Okay. Uh, I, I was wondering if you're trying to link them somehow. Well, I, I, I'm wondering if do you see that there might be a link? Okay, that's what I was wondering, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a reference to the big five personality traits that you can find a good Wikipedia article on. Um, it's one of the many ways to organize personality traits. It's not the way. Um, you, there are like a thousand personality traits. You can split them up and group them into many different uh, categories. But the most popular one and the one that has the most uh, grouping evidence for it is the big five. And one of the big five traits is openness to experience, where you, you either rate zero or, or max, but you're on the spectrum somewhere in this idea of openness to experience. Now, openness to experience means uh, you're willing to go try new things, essentially. Um, and being close to experience means you don't want anything to change. And not surprising, uh, there's a high correlation between close to experience and conservatism. Uh, conservatives are highly close to experience. Uh, and I think the causal relation is from personality to conservatism. If you're close to experience, you never learn that there are different things out there that are different, so you never think about the world differently. And so you get stuck in a conservative rut. Um, so I think, uh, there are, I think there are ways to encourage people who are close to experience to be a little more open to experience. You can move a little bit on the spectrum with encouragement and habituation. Uh, because that's so vital to so many other things. Political rights, uh, um, you know, a political party that doesn't destroy it, it actually builds the government, that destroys the government. You know, there's lots of things that result in uh, climate change. You can pick any issue. Uh, close to experience personality types are somewhere behind it. Uh, so it's a bigger issue than just polyamory. Um, does it connect to compar the compersion jealousy spectrum? Uh, no, I wouldn't say exactly it does. What it, what it would do, and this is hypothetical, and this is what I suspect you'll find if you do a study on this, is that being close to experience will prevent you from ever exploring polyamory, even in conversation and fantasy, right? Um, it, you'll want it out of your mind. This is something not even think about. Um, being open to experience would make you highly likely to explore it, and therefore you'll find that you like it, and so you'll have a statistical effect of many polyamorous, of, 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 of disproportionate number of polyamorous are going to be open to, have openness to experience, because those are the people who are getting out of the balloon, as it were. So um, it's more of an emergent correlation. Yeah, that's what I would say, and, and, and they're also different, because the compersion and jealousy scale is more about getting rid of uh, both social assumptions and uh, your own personal demons, right? So, so jealousy actually comes in many, there's many aspects of jealousy. One is possessiveness, which is the idea that you own this person and other people don't get to play with your toys. Um, that's just a stupid idea that should be gotten rid of altogether, right? So you're actually a bad person if you think that way and you, you should fix that. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's other aspect of it is, uh, is not much talked about, but is a, it's big in polyamory, especially when people first try it out, which is envy. Jealousy oftentimes is actually envy, where your partner's getting lots of dates, you're getting none, they're having all the fun, you're not. 
Um, that's a solvable problem, by the way, but, uh, but it requires communication and mutual help with each other and so on. Um, uh, but it, it, that's a legitimate feeling, because you're, 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 they're getting more out of the relationship than you are. It's legitimate to say that and point that out, because it's true. Uh, and and you, have, you have a grievance there, not necessarily against them, but against what's happening. Uh, and so that if, if they love you, they should be totally game for helping you solve that problem, making it more equitable in some way. Um, the other one, uh, the other aspect, which is the one that's most common, I think, is simply insecurity. Uh, jealousy is actually a manifestation of the fear that, oh no, they're going to leave me and I'm going to be alone. Um, and sometimes that fear is justified. Sometimes not only is it justified that maybe they shouldn't, it's justified in the sense that they actually should leave you, you should go get somebody else. But, um, uh, but sometimes it's justified in the sense that, yeah, they're, they're, they're probably going to go off with someone else. Uh, but a lot of times it's not, uh, especially if you if you're understand the values of polyamory, you go into it ethically in the right way, um, you'll find that, in fact, they're not going to leave you. Um, that, in fact, uh, you're actually going to have better communication between each other. Um, it'll actually improve the relationship in some way. So that's also possible. So, uh, being open to experience is being open to the possibility that that might happen and then go and see if it happens, right? Being close to experience, you're going to focus on the fear uh, of, of that leaving you. Um, so, uh, so these are psychological things, that, and polyamorous have written tons about these things. There's lots of resources out there. If you are a jealous person um, uh, and you want to analyze why you're jealous, and if that's fixable or what ways it's fixable, um, there's tons of articles about that. I, I can do a whole talk on that, actually. Good question, by the way. I was interested. Yeah. Could you speak to the possible evolutionary advantages and or disadvantages of polyamory? I don't know. Not being an evolutionist, That's sorry. Possible. Uh, yeah. Um, no. I. Uh, there are there are some things that have been uh, pointed out by Daryl Ray, for example. Um, he's done talks on this. I think some of them might even be accessible online. Um, pointing out that um, our anatomical design is actually built to be non-monogamous, so that it actually appears to be advantageous to not only for men to have multiple women, but for women to have multiple uh, fathers. Um, why that is, is a whole other question. Uh, and you can actually look at and compare us to other species like bonobos or chimpanzees and so on that are closer to us. And they're, they're not perfect parallels because we evolved. You look at bonobos versus chimps or, or apes, throw those in there, that their uh, sexual cultures or gender cultures are bizarrely different from each other. Um, and yet we evolved from all of them, which one are we most like, or are we most like any of them? Uh, that's something that's a big complicated question to answer. Uh, but the, there's no evidence that the biology says that we were we evolved to be monogamous, um, or that we specifically evolved to be uh, non-monogamous. Um, it's possible that the evolution, in terms of the, the blindness of evolution, didn't care. Uh, as, as long as the model works in terms of producing differential reproductive success, which is more for us a function of culture than biology. Uh, so it's really the cultural mechanism. And I'll give you an example of how we see evidence of this. There's, um, I wrote an article uh, about uh, is 90 there is 90 percent of ego psych false, uh, ego psych uh, E V O uh, P S Y C K. I talk about a lot of ego psych literature in there, and one of the articles I get to in there uh, is about uh, analyzing the way uh, people's uh, sexuality is policed in terms of. Um, how much men versus women are taught to behave prim and proper and modestly and so on. And, and, and the, there are huge differences by culture. If you look at different cultures, the way uh, people are taught to be not modest or not modest, the way they're taught their sexuality is restricted varies. And one of the co-variables that actually correlates uh, with it um, has to do with the actual specific economic structures, uh, which is a cultural construct. So it's not an environmental, it's not biological. Uh, it's something that the humans created that results in them creating a particular economic way of solving this particular problem that they created themselves. Uh, and it results in certain models of oppressing women more or less, uh, for example. Uh, and I talk about that, so if you're interested in that, that's, go look for that one section. There's, it's a huge long article, so you'll have to dig through to find the one piece. But uh, that one thing is interesting for that reason, because it shows that, that variation in terms of monogamy versus non-monogamy are models of how we do it are more governed by cultural structures than they are governed by biological structures. Yeah. You talked about um, the studies being done on children in polyamorous families. Are there um, any studies that you know of um, for children that were raised primarily in monogamous relationships that whose parents kind of uprooted everything and ended up being polyamorous, say, when they were teenagers? And what about the ethics of it? Is it like something that you should wait to do when they're out of the house? Because um, you're literally uprooting their whole world. Yeah. Um, 
The, the short answer is yes, sort of. Um, there, in, the, in the studies that have been done of children in polyamorous societies or polyamorous groups, um, some of those samples uh, were families where that happened. Uh, so we have some case studies, let's say. So it's, it's not a broad enough database to actually make sweeping generalizations about. Um, but nothing, what, the, what was found in terms of also comparing them to monogamous families, the stay monogamous, um, stay monogamous because they often break up. Uh, that in fact uh, there was no observable difference in terms of the effect of, for example, divorce uh, and and polyamory. In fact, there, there's, there were no negative associations found with polyamory being a thing. Um, now we have we can find some isolated examples of some kids who are annoyed by it uh, and have brands to say about it. Uh, but we also have tons tons more kids who say like, yeah, you know, it's, uh, I, I have. Uh, for example, friends that their their parents are breaking up, and that's awful. And then here, my parents have I said more parents, um, right? So, um, and I think that the trend is even in psychology to suggest that it's actually to have more communication with your kids rather than less, rather than trying to shield them from things. Um, and it becomes complicated. I know several uh, polyamorous people who have our parents and have dealt with this issue growing up that they're raising their kids. Um, and most of them have picked the model where they, they tell their kids what's going on very early, but also tell them that you're going to get a lot of prejudice from people if you talk about it. And so that puts them in a compromising position, but at least it's an honest position uh, so the kids can make a decision about it. Kids are actually more confident than most people give credit. Um, however, uh, I can't give definitive answers to that question because that is really a family therapist's uh, skill set. Issue. So um, I, there are a lot of, again, polyamory friendly uh, family therapists that will know a lot more about that and have better answers for it. Uh, but um, what is, oh, I can't remember her name. Hang on just a moment. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, the, the scholar that has written on this a lot, and she's <coughs> continuing to do research, by the way, so she might be interested in research uh, suggestions as to what, which sort of problems to look at. Uh, I am going to try and find her. Just talking to her the other day. I might have to tell you later. Oh, Eli Chef, yes. Uh, Elizabeth Chef, Dr. Elizabeth Chef. Um, uh, she's got uh, openingup.net. Uh, she's also written for Washington Post and other things like that. Um, she's done some of those family studies. She's continuing to do more. Uh, but if you're interested in that specific question and you don't think her research so far answers it adequately, send her an email or a letter and say, like, I'd like some science done on this. Can we make that happen? And I, I would recommend that. That'd be nice. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Uh, the book Sex on at Dawn, I'm sure you've read it. What parts of the book did you really like and what do you disagree with? I actually haven't read Sex at Dawn. I know its thesis and I know it's in it and I've read the reviews and critiques of it. Uh, but I haven't read the book itself. Uh, for those who are interested, Sex at Dawn uh, was written by anthropologists, I believe, right? Um, uh, physical anthropologists who wrote about, or cultural anthropologists. Yeah, it was cultural anthropologists who wrote this book making the argument that uh, human societies were originally not monogamous. Um, and they, they have many samples from current uh, different societies uh, that have escaped the uh, plague of modernity, I guess. Um, anyway, so they, they, they do a lot, they talk about this a lot. Um, now, they've been criticized for some of their statements being more speculative than scientifically secure, uh, but at the same time, I've seen some of their stuff and it, some of it is good, so it's hit or miss, I guess. Uh, but that's just it's other people's judgments, not mine. Um, so, uh, but it is talked about a lot. Um, I'm more interested really in the how to build an ethical model of it, so that's why I recommend More Than Two, which is about how to be polyamorous, uh, rather than were we polyamorous one time, uh, although I find that an interesting question. Uh, so it's the only reason I haven't read that yet is I've been focusing on the making polyamory work uh, side of things, and that's just been where my labor has gone lately. But, um, but that is a book, and many people have read it, and everybody that I've talked to personally loves the book, so <laughs> that's all I can say. There, there, are, there are critiques of it online you can read about it. I think there's a whole thing on Wikipedia as well. Um, I wouldn't trust everything said on Wikipedia in terms of their critics, uh, but you can at least see what the debate is, what the arguments are. Yeah? Are you planning on doing any books on the site? Not, not soon. Um, for one thing, I want a lot more experience at it before I write a book about it. Um, secondly, there are other people already writing excellent books about it, uh, so I'm not sure what I would have to add. Um, but maybe in a few years I'll look back and look around and say, you know, okay, here's a niche that hasn't been filled yet. Um, 
Yeah. So even in terms of like books for people who are beginning in polyamory, like I like I ones or um, I think maybe like maybe a book on solo polyamory would be worthwhile. No one's done that, but there's lots of really excellent writing on it online already. So um, the fact is, I've got five books under contract already, so that I'm going to be occupied for a couple of years, uh, and that's not one of them. But uh, so no. <laughs> Can you tell us what they are. Uh, yes, for those who are interested, um, the first is coming out. Uh, it's nearly finished. Um, it goes to uh, the printer or goes to the editor uh, in June. Uh, is Science Education in the Early Roman Empire, uh, which is a piece of my dissertation at Columbia University, dusted off and uh, updated for, uh, for the field. Uh, that covers the whole field of education, how their education system worked in the ancient Roman world, and what its science content was. And I even include things like uh, a popular culture means of, like we have television, for example, that promulgates science. Uh, they had equivalent things like uh, public lectures and things like that. Um, so I even talk about how all how science information got filtered to the public, who learned what, how good was it, uh, all of that stuff I talk about. Now that's in preparation for the sequel, which is The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire, which is a social study of scientists in the Roman Empire, and what people thought about them, uh, who they were, uh, how, they were um, how they were perceived, what they did, what their lives were like, where they came from, uh, the, basically a, a, a social history of the scientists. Uh, but I also have a whole chapter in there on the, the, the like, sort of canned history of ancient science and technology. Um, so I have a lot of that in there, um, and amusing stories and whatnot. Uh, so that'll be out probably early, 2017. And then um, either before or after that, depending, I'm coming out with two pop market versions of other books. I'm going to make a shorter, simpler version and update it as well of Sense and Goodness Without God. Sense of Goodness Without God still holds up. It's a really good uh, packaged worldview uh, for looking at how to be a humanist, how to be an atheist, what should we believe in rather than uh, what don't we believe in. Um, and I want to make a smaller, more accessible version of that that people can say, like, here's an example of one of our worldviews. Uh, and then I'm going to do a pop market version of the History of City of Jesus. The History of City of Jesus, which I'll be selling shortly, uh, is a monumental tome that's comprehensive. It has 100 pages of it are just bibliography and indexes. Um, uh, heavily footnoted and so on. So I'm going to make a pop market version of that, but that might be years away. Uh, I'm under contract, but uh, who knows when it'll finally come out. It'll be a while. Um, let's see, what did I miss? There was one other. One, two, three, four. I forgot the fifth one. Oh, uh, yeah, um, possibly something on Feminism 101. Um, that's not fully under contract yet, but uh, uh, there are negotiations ongoing. So, yeah. Okay, I have two questions. I'm sorry, I'm a little um, I really enjoyed kind of the, the, the symbolism that you were using where you were talking about how um, keeping someone in a monogamous, monogamous relationship is unethical because it, it keeps them from knowing kind of that polyamorous uh, existence. And um, I was thinking back to kind of my religious days about how knowledge of the Bible is very equated with them, like to know a woman is to have sex with her. So mm -hmm. that equation of knowledge with sex. And so I just thought it was kind of interesting that that same, that same kind of symbol <laughs> is being used, like knowledge equals sex, or sex equals knowledge is being mm -hmm. used in this context. Yeah. I wonder if you could on that. Uh, well, it's certainly true, right? The more that this is, oh gosh, I was just talking to someone recently about this. Uh, in the kink community, regarding kink, um, especially people in religious communities have these sexual fantasies and desires that they think are shameful and horrible uh, and don't explore them um, and are miserable, and they're unhappy, they're unhappy in their sexual relationships because they don't communicate to their partners as to what they like and then their partners don't like what's going on either because they're, you know, they're not talking either. Um, whereas if we had a much more open, if you were to actually go explore the kink community and learn, like read a lot about it and see what the options are, and find like how you can actually ethically pursue uh, various kinks and fantasies and things like that. Um, you would be liberated. You would be uh, much better off. And yet, but it's all about knowledge that starts that. You have to know that that exists as a thing. Um, and, and that reminds. And the next is to know how you pursue it, how you pursue it safely, how do you pursue it ethically, and so on. Uh, this is a whole body of knowledge. It's, it, once you have all that knowledge, now you're empowered and you can go do stuff. Um, but it reminds me on the polyamory set, uh, question. Um, I was dating. Uh, a factory worker uh, once uh, as polyamorous, we were both polyamorous, and she was at work, but she, she's kind of like, she doesn't really hide her polyamory, but she doesn't really talk about it either. 
until she was sitting down with a coworker, and her coworker started asking her, like, do you have a boyfriend, and so on. And so she had to say, like, well, I'm actually, I'm polyamorous, I have multiple boyfriends, and so on. And, and, and her, the, yeah, she was all ready to, like, have this, like, shaming thing going on. And, no, her coworker said, that's a thing? That would solve so many problems. <laughs> Um, notice how knowledge just changed, that blew her mind, right? It changed her perspective on the world. Just knowing that it exists as a thing uh, changes uh, everything. So, yeah, so yes, knowledge relates to human happiness and uh, sexual freedom and everything. So, yeah. Oh, did you, you had a second yeah. one? I said. Yeah, you may have. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was fortunate enough to, um, to witness like a swinger relationship. Um, between uh, married, like a, it was a heterosexual swinger couple. Mm -hmm. And they've been together for like 10 years. And I witnessed that they had, like they have certain couples that they had a very kind of deep connection with, right? They considered themselves swingers because they also would be in with people that they didn't necessarily have kind of a deeper connection with. Mm -hmm. And so, my argument is, and I don't know if this is correct or not, that that kind of situation is subsumed in a way under this polyamorous umbrella. Yeah, so this so how, yeah, what do you have to say? This, this gets into identity politics as an issue, um, where um, people should be allowed to pick their own labels for themselves. And the, and the example we have in our community is atheist versus agnostic, right? Um, you can harangue someone for saying they're an agnostic and say, you should really just admit you're an atheist. But there might be reasons they're saying agnostic, right? Um, and those reasons might be legitimate. I mean, they might be a school teacher in Alabama, for example. Um, where it's because agnostic, agnostic is a safer label, right? It's, it's easier to coast through the social prejudice of society with that label. And there may be a legitimate reason for you to have to do that. Same way that if you're polyamorous, you might have to hide it from uh, your coworkers or from your bosses or, your, or whoever. Um, so, so I don't really, uh, I don't do uh, identity police on, policing on people. So if someone doesn't want to call themselves polyamorous, that's fine. Um, I think from a clinical perspective, as a third party observer, like if historians were to sift through their junk mail, uh, or through their, through their mail, their email after you know, a thousand years, they would identify them as polyamorous, right? Uh, and because and, of many polyamorous um, uh, relationships, uh, polycules, that do that model, where they have really close, loving relationships with a few people, and then also all of them date like, more casually outside as well. That's actually fairly common. Uh, polyfidelity is actually the less common model of polyamory. Um, so when you describe, you know, objectively from third-party analysis, you'd say that they're just poly, and they just they date outside of that as well. Um, they practice other forms of ethical non-monogamy in addition to it. Uh, but I wouldn't force them to take the label. If they want to call themselves only swingers and avoid the word poly, that's totally fine, and they might have good reason. Yeah. I actually have an excellent uh, example that I use either in explaining kind of that spectrum to people who are unfamiliar or in <coughs> people helping to figure out how it is that they want to identify and not mm -hmm. feeling confined to that, which mm -hmm. is that if you think of polyamory and swinging on a spectrum, like me personally, I identify very far on the poly end of the spectrum, however, that does not remove me from potentially having a relationship that is functionally far closer to the swinger end of the spectrum. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, I like that. There's been a lot of growth in the last 10, 15 years since I've been in Salt Lake <coughs> of those two, two communities. It mm -hmm. used to be, oh, poly people, they're the rich ones with feelings, and swingers, they're the ones that just want to fuck everything. But now, <laughs> so much more growth. Both parties, the, those different communities, are now acknowledging and communicating with each other far more openly. That is fantastic. About the overlap. Yeah. That, yes, I can just be in both, and yes, I have relationships that are, that are both. So yeah, I'm happy to hear about that because there, there has been uh, in the last like 20 years a sort of antipathy between the swinging community and the poly community where they're you know, huffy polyamorous it's just we're not swingers and it's swingers that say we're not poly. Um, those poly people who all eat dinner together, how weird. Um, <laughs> the, um, but the reality is that reality on the ground is that there, there aren't those straight optional models. There's like a whole continuum, like you said, between swinging and polyamory. There's a whole continuum of things that people are actually doing. So in reality, it is a spectrum, uh, and I would like to see more, uh, you know, communication because they can both help each other in terms of discussion of ethics and and, and uh, communicating experiences and, and all of that stuff. So yeah, that that's a positive development. I'm glad to hear that's happened here that they're talking to each other. Yeah, I was just going to say I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Okay. Then, so that we can get 
Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. All right, one more. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to check everybody. I'm going to pick you. Yeah. It's <laughs> more of just kind of a correlation to what you were saying. It, and ties in with a lot of the judgment on sexuality. It's like if you're a swinger, you're, you're a bad person who wants to fuck everybody. But if you're polyamorous, it's okay because you're in love and it's okay. Yes. I, my own personal diagram I have is you, my Venn diagram is monogamy, non-monogamy, and where they intersect is polyamory. But there's no judgment on any of it. It is just you're either practicing non-monogamy, either ethically or non-ethically, depending on what's going on. Polyamorous, for my personal perspective, is more of a committed relationship to one, two, five, say how it you know, mm -hmm. more than one. Yeah. And then there's the monogamy that says no, we're just like oh, I see. What you, yeah, I see what you're, what you're, where the comparison is. Um, yeah, in terms of you, you have a spectrum in terms of fidelity and, and the way you model fidelity. Yeah. And um, yeah. Okay yeah. So that that's where the nexus there, where monogamy and poly fidelity, there, that's where they apex, and then you have a looser poly that gets a little further away from that, uh, more open poly, for example. Um, that gets to respectability politics, though, by the way. Um, now, there's, in terms of that, in terms of what you want for yourself, which is, I think, that the, yeah. the primary governing umbrella concept should be that you should be able to negotiate and have the relationships you want, and you should not be judged for that, as long as you're being honest, as long as you're being compassionate, as long as you're not hurting people, right? Well, that's um, in this diagram, though. There's a, it isn't a judgment call. It's oh, yeah, yeah. That's but this, that's yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, but that, but it happens is what I was going to get well, to. So, uh, so like you have this respectability politics that's very similar to what happened uh, with the gay community in terms of gay marriage, where in order to make gay marriage respectable, it had to follow the monogamous model of, of heterosexual couples, um, because if it deviated from that, then, it, then it's no longer respectable. Um, which is unfortunate. So there are a lot of gay activists who pointed out, like, no, we should be able to have whatever relationships we want. Um, we don't have to be exactly like hetero couples. Um, and so I think the same thing happens with polyamory. There are, I've run into polyamorists who actually are judgmental about swingers because of that, because, oh, we, and this is the thing, is that, oh, we all have, we all sit down and have dinner together and, you know, share a checkbook or whatever, um, because that's trying to emulate the respectability of the monogamy unit. Whereas I think we should make more models acceptable and respectable. Um, uh, and, and, Right, none of them need to be judged, I yeah. think. So yeah, so I think it is, is, we need to be open to all the possible models and not practice that respectability politics, which is, uh, that harms people ultimately. Okay, that's the last one. We've got books set up. Uh, this is what I do for a living, by the way, speaking, writing books, and so on. I'm an independent author and scholar. Uh, and I'm engaging in a very extensive move to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so if you want to help me support, want to help support my work in general and my move or anything like that, Come buy some books and I'll sign them or I'll sign anything else you want to bring up. So, thanks. On um, behalf of Atheist Utah, who uh, sponsored the talk tonight, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I appreciate it. Come on over and uh, say hi and get a book signed and enjoy the rest of your evening. If you have questions, comments, concerns, compliments, corrections, or concepts for content, contact the show via email at godlessrevolution at gmail.com, by text or voicemail at 330-81-REBEL, or Twitter the Twatter at TGI Podcast. Thanks, bitches. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this talk and bonus episode of The Godless Revolution as much as I did. You can find more information about Dr. Carrier and his work by visiting his website, www.richardcarrier.info.